would you ever recommend stretching layer two to remote sites, say using VXLAN or OTV, which we just mentioned, or should layer two stretching be designed out at all costs? Well, you know, I mean, OTV can bound the problem Terry was talking about, uh, spanning tree and, and so on, keep those certain layer two challenges isolated. So you've still got isolated domains there. Uh, that, that's what they're designed to do. But I would never recommend stretching layer two. I would always design it out if I could. Uh, I would want you know, address independence. Um, I would not want to have any dependency on a specific address range. I'd want to be able to fail over uh, completely independently. I would, in theory, what I'd want to be able to do is have my primary data center literally go completely down. Uh, throw the big red switch, you know, nothing. It can't function at all and have everything work just fine on the other data center with a completely unique set of IP addresses and so on. Um, and there are those exceptions that make that very difficult, but that that's the goal that I would go for personally. I would only look at um, VXLAN or OTV or whatever other solutions are out there in that space if I had to because I was I was forced to because reasons that that's my take what about you guys yeah i agree with that 100 percent um <clears throat> you know you're, you're always going to have legacy applications or you're always going to have those scenarios where we need to drop this black box whatever that needs to be able to talk back to the data center and have those scenarios you know those are going to be out there and you're not going to be able to just say well get rid of that software and buy something brand new um you know so see that's why those tools are there but those should be, like you said, a last mile, a last ditch effort. We have to do this. So how do we design this the best way? Yeah, I mean, if you look at the cloud providers and web scalers, they don't do layer two. And there's a reason for that because <laughs> you're serving hundreds of thousands of customers and uh, spanning lay layer two everywhere. It's not gonna get you to, to that availability, availability that you want to. So ideally no, but everyone, has some use case. But technically, yeah, there's layer two. It just doesn't go very far. Yeah, true. So yeah, yeah, very isolated. Exactly. Um, it's it, it's at the access switch, and that's it. Doesn't actually extend beyond that. Uh, okay. You know, I so really we're talking. Take, yeah, I, I think you really have to take into account the entire network design. Um, okay. Are are you really planning for you know, going back to the previous question? Are you really planning for your main data center to go down? And is that why you're stretching layer two out there? Um, you, you need to, how is the routing working in that case? Why do you need layer two stretched across there? Because there's nothing left at the primary data center. Power is out. So why are you stretching? And you bring up a good point there too. I, I think a lot of people get caught up in the fact of, you know, we absolutely cannot have any type of outage and DR failover has to be smoothless as possible and perfect and it's like does it need to be you know you, you have a massive mm -hmm. outage here there's gonna be chaos you're not gonna be able to engineer around some of it so what's what's reasonable here and what's expected and what can you handle and do you actually have to have layer two going that way to handle it yeah i think a big thing that gets into all of these decisions is how is your application that you're trying to to make highly available how is it engineered What's this architecture? Is it active active? Because if it's not active active, then I'm, I'm not sure that you have the kind of failover you want to have happen. Yeah. I mean, one problem yeah. is often to, to do multi-homing with IPv4 because you're kind of bound with that to have a minimum of a slash 24. So it might be a bit easier with IPv6 when when you have some more freedom to, to split with your subnets compared to IPv4 because it might be difficult, especially now, to get get that slash 24 for, for your services. Terry, going back to your point about active-active, well, right, architecturally, you would want that, and, and, and ideally, both data centers would be processing in an active-active fashion, but right. I think what some enterprises are doing is not that. They've just got... It, and this, I'm not advocating this, but I know that people do this. They've got some old junk sitting in a computer room somewhere powered off and their idea of disaster recovery as well if, if the main data center goes down we're going to power all this stuff up and it's going to work and 
you know, it's just, that's just terrible. But I know philosophically, some companies think they're saving money with a disaster recovery. That that's our plan. They've checked the box on some compliance report saying they've got a, a, a DR plan, but in fact, it's just idle equipment sitting in a rack doing nothing. That's probably underpowered and was written off as an asset a couple of years ago or something. Yeah, my recommendation is go test it. <laughs>